I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Today we read from the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, events that were taking place in the early days of the church. Let us hear these holy words. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph, whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. We again say a word of greeting this morning to all of you. We say a special word of greeting to those in McGee, Mariana, Hollis, and by the way, it's not McGee, as I was told by about 400 people last Sunday. So we try it again. If it's not McGee, I don't care anymore. I've done my best. So, but we do say a word of greeting to all of those people, and as well as those who are homebound and in our respective hospitals across the state of Arkansas. I want to remind you, you should have received information this past week, that our habitat build for us begins on May the 20th, which is on a Saturday. We currently have 19 out of 20 slots still available. You can call the church office, you can get on our website and find information about how you can sign up to do that. We very much need those 20 folks to start this process. We've got many, many opportunities to build over the next several weeks, but we want to begin in a strong and powerful way, so we hope that you'll make an effort to be a part of that. We're thankful for your presence this morning. We continue our series of sermons looking at the promises we make with the vows we take when we unite with the United Methodist Church. Today we talk about gifts. Let us pray. O Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. I remember I was serving a church when one day I received a call from a member of my congregation who was extremely wealthy, a big landowner made a lot of money in the business world, had retired to this particular community, and was living a luxurious, affluent life. He called me and said, John, I need to stop by. I've got a check for the church. He said, I want to make an appointment. I want to sit down with you, and I want to talk about my gift. I said, I'm happy to do so. You tell me when, and I'll make sure I'm here. He said, let's get it done. It's a very generous contribution. I was excited. I was licking my chops. I could not wait. We made an appointment over the phone. He knew where my office was. It was on the second floor, but he stopped by the first floor to tell everybody that he was coming to my office to make a substantial gift. He came in my office and he sat down. He placed an envelope in front of me and he said, you can go ahead and open it. I opened it. It was a check for $100. At first, I wanted to say, this is a joke, right? I mean, where's the other couple of zeros on this? You can afford that easily. He said, now listen, I know the church is kind of struggling right now. I wanted to do my part. I said, thank you, and he left. A couple of other times while I was there, he did the same thing, calling the church to make an appointment, to come and see me, to make a generous offer, but first stopping by the offices downstairs to let everybody know what he was doing. I finally got to a place where I said, just leave it with the secretary. I was serving another church. It was the end of the year. The church was way behind financially. We had had a hurricane. We had had other issues that caused us to go several Sundays without worship. It took a great toll on the church financially. And at the end of the year, I stood up and said, this is how far behind we are, and it looks like we're not going to make it. 
but thank you to everybody who was generous. The next morning, I received a call from a man in the church, and he said, I want to stop by and leave a check. I said, okay, tell me when you want to stop by. He said, I want to enable the church to finish the year strong. I said, you do realize we're $500,000 short. He said, I understand. I said, well, I have a lunch appointment, but I'll be happy to meet with you after lunch. He said, you got it. Well, while I was at lunch, he stopped by. My administrative assistant wasn't there. I wasn't there. He placed an envelope on her desk and left. No one else knew about it. When the administrative assistant got back, she said, John, this is for you. Your name's on it. I opened it up. It was a check for $500,000. See, one person was all show, very little substance. The other one was all substance, no show. A long time ago, in the early days of the church, they came up with an ingenious plan to make sure everyone was provided for, that everyone had enough, that no one would go without. They pooled their resources in the Christian community. And Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, tells us that they were all of one heart and soul. That means they were completely united in the effort. And that the great grace of God was upon them. And that they shared everything they had and they placed it at the feet of the apostles. In other words, they gave the apostles the responsibility to distribute all the resources that they had available. To make sure that everyone was provided for and no one went without. Which of course it tells us from the early days of the church... The responsibility of followers of Jesus Christ has to been, been to give away a portion of what we have to make sure that everyone has and no one goes without. The church has always been about generosity. The church has always been about sharing resources to make sure everyone is cared for. I would be loyal to Jesus Christ through Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church with my gifts. We take that vow when we unite with the congregation. I will be loyal with my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. And today we talk about gifts. We are fortunately a part of a very generous congregation. When I arrived, we had a $250,000 line of credit that could not be paid back to the bank. That fall, we paid it back in full. We were behind in a lot of ways, and we had a surplus by the end of the year. Money had been borrowed from particular funds. All those monies were put back, repaid. In 2022, we paid off a $1.5 million debt. We are debt-free. Just this year, we raised with a goal of $40,000 to build a Habitat for Humanity house. We raised $171,000, so we're going to get to build a second house. We raised more than $70,000 for tornado relief. So, so far this year, we have raised well over a quarter of a million dollars outside of the budget to make sure there are those who are provided for. But the problem is we have to remind ourselves that our giving is above and beyond our vow of commitment to support the ministry budget of the church. We are significantly behind in our ministry budget going into the summer. And quite frankly, like most churches in the summer, it is a Mojave Desert dry spell around here financially. That's just the way it is. People are traveling, people are doing all kinds of things, and sometimes, quite frankly, the church is not at the top of the list. We need everybody, please, to remember that when we ask for an appeal of some sort, it is above and beyond. It is an extra mile. It is an addition to what we already promised God we would do. Because we have raised so much money outside, there have those who have chosen to give to something else instead of the commitment to the ministry budget, and that's all well and good, and we're incredibly grateful 
and incredibly appreciative. But let's not forget our fundamental responsibility, our first responsibility, to support the ministry budget of the church. We need to go into the summer in great shape to get through the summer. We're not there. We need your help. And I know talking about money makes people uncomfortable. I don't always like to talk about money. In fact, I can't really think of any time when it's been at the top of my list as a subject to preach about. But it is necessary and it is important. And Susan and I do it. So I feel like I have a right to talk about it. There's a group called Nonprofit Association that comes up with statistics. They say that on average, the church-going Christian in today's world gives 2.5% of her or his income to the church. During the Great Depression, it was 3.3%. Now remember, the biblical standard is a tithe. That's 10%. We don't talk a lot about a tithe, and I don't sometimes, because quite frankly, I know there are people who can give away 40% of the income, and it wouldn't phase them, and they ought to do it. And there are other people, quite frankly, who just cannot do 10%. And I recognize that. But the biblical standard is a tithe. Remember what Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, what it is you commit financially, that's where your loyalty lies. Is it God first? You promised it would be. You made a vow if you united with the United Methodist Church, you promised God. Paul says, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. God loves a cheerful giver. We give because we want to. We don't give under compulsion because the preacher says to do so. We give so because it's an expression of thanksgiving to God for all that God has done for us. I love the story of Peter Marshall, who was at one time the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Peter Marshall was a very famous preacher who left his respective church to become chaplain of the Senate. He lived in the middle part of the early to middle part of the 20th century. He died a very young man. But one day, someone came into Peter Marshall's office, a member of his church, and said, Dr. Marshall, I need to tell you that when I was making $20,000 a year, which is a lot of money in the 1940s, when I was making $20,000 a year, I tithed. The church got $2,000 from me. But he said, I'm a wealthy man now. I make $500,000 a year. I cannot give $50,000 a year to the church. It hurts too much to do that. And Peter Marshall responded, well, clearly we have a problem here. Let me pray for you. Is that okay? Well, of course, Pastor, you can pray for me. And Peter Marshall said, dear Lord, we have a problem here. This man has come into my office and said he could give $2,000 when he was making $20,000, but he can't give $50,000 when he's making $500,000. Lord, I pray that you reduce his salary back to $20,000 a year so he can tithe again. Now, our responsibility fundamentally is to remind ourselves that our loyalties lie oftentimes with how it is we spend our money to what it is to whom we support. Where does the church rank in all of that? We made a commitment. We made a promise, a vow before the body of Christ and most importantly before God that we would support the ministry budget of the church with our gifts. That's our money. Always remember the preacher who said, Lord, no matter what we say, no matter what we do, what we put in the plate is what we really think of you. Where does God rank in terms of your giving? Where is the church and the ministry of Jesus Christ with regard to how you go about spending your income? Now, I have over the years received lots of emails and letters and people who came into my office and are upset when I talk about giving, but it's something that Jesus talked about more than anything else with the exception of the kingdom of God. 
That was the second most popular topic that Jesus preached about and taught. More than forgiveness, more than loving thy neighbor. What do you do with your money? Jesus knew in those days that money matters were just as important as they are to us today. The church ought to be in the business of trying to figure out how to use all the resources we have available to us to do the work we need to do to make a profound difference in the world and not sometimes to figure out how we can cut back, how we can trim. Just part of being a part of the life of the church. And there is something spiritually amiss with anyone who has the capacity to give, who has taken a vow to do it, and does not do so. She or he reneges on the vow they took, the promise they made to God and to God's church. It's just that simple. And here's what's even more interesting. You have to remember that every time someone joins the church and we offer those vows, we have a response, which means you will notice that every time somebody joins the church and they take those vows, we reaffirm our vows. So we make that promise all over again, week after week after week, that we will support the church with our finances, with our gifts. Do we lie week after week or do we tell the truth and it's evident in how we go about living? Now I know there are people who will say, well, I don't know if that's pre-tax or if that's after taxes and I don't know why I give to all these other organizations as well and the church gets a portion of it, but I have a commitment to everything else. But here's what I would say. There is only one entity that I stood before God and God's people and made a sworn vow to give to, and that is the church. Susan and I give to the church. Susan and I give to lots of other organizations and lots of other ministries. But Pulaski Heights is first for us, and it should be. Because I have never made a vow, a promise, before God to give to my alumni association. We give, but I've never made that same commitment. Or to the SPCA, or to the Museum of Fine Arts, or to public classic radio stations, or to St. Jude's, or to the several other organizations to which we contribute. All very, very important, but I've only made one promise. Susan and I have only made one sworn vow, and that was to God and God's church. That means God should be first. Look, our levels of income are different. I get all that. So that means our level of giving should be different. But the sacrifice should be the same. And the commitment should be the same. And keeping the promise should be universal. We really do need your help going into the summer. And when we make special appeals or pleas, it should be above and beyond what you should already be giving. Or it's going to hurt our effort to do the daily work we're called to do. We don't ever want to get to a place where we can't take up a special offering because we know if we take up a special offering, it's going to kill what it is we need to have to do the work on a daily basis. We can do both easily. This church can do whatever it chooses to do and has for generations. You have a proven, powerful track record. We just want to keep it going. And as we approach the summertime, this series of sermons we're doing it's appropriate that we talk about the fact and be honest with the church. You all, we're not where we need to be as we go into the summer. We need your help. Your help. Those of you who are members of this church or those of you who have made a commitment to support the church in some way, please do so. Maybe a little bit extra. Maybe for the first time. We need it. It's just that simple. My very first church, I was real good friends with a Baptist preacher whose church was just less than a block away from my church. He called me one day and he said, I want to tell you what just happened. It's a sermon illustration. He said, I had a man come in off of I-35 and he said, listen, preacher, I don't want a handout, but I was wondering if there's anything I could do to earn $10. Preacher said, let me just give you $10. No, sir. 
I want to earn it. He said, well, we got an old beat up lawnmower in the back. If you want to mow the church lawn, that's fine. You can do that. Those of us who served little churches in those days, we did all of it. We did the lawn work. We cleaned the commodes. We did the youth program and the United Methodist Women. We did it all. And he wasn't any different in his church from what I was dealing with in mine. So the man came, mowed the yard. The preacher said he did a beautiful job of mowing the yard. He came up and I tried to give him a 20. And he said, no, 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 the deal was $10 but you need it. So no, $10, please. Preacher gave him a $10 bill. So the man left and before long he came back, he had a $1 bill in his hand. He said, preacher, I need to give this to the church. He said, what is this? He said, it's my tithe, my 10%. He said, you keep that dollar. My Lord have mercy. If anybody needs to keep that dollar, it's you. And he said, please don't do that to me. He said, God's been so good to me. My gift to the church is always my thank you to God. Please let me say thank you to God. And the Baptist preacher took the dollar and put it with the rest of the offering. Our giving to the church really is our thank you to God. To say, God, we know in and through Jesus Christ how much you love us. And you expect us to be a part of the life of the church in such a way that we do the work of Jesus Christ. So I want to say thank you to you, God. So here's my part. Like the early church, God, I'm called to share everything I have. And so is everyone else. And if we all do that, there is no great need that goes unmet. I will be loyal to Jesus Christ through Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church with my gifts. We promised. We promised. Hallelujah. Amen.